is if we translate that idea of features, benefits, and even a step more important to people is what's the problem that it solves? And then a step deeper than that, what's the emotional resonance of solving that problem? And we come back to a... Welcome to the Marketing Your Practice podcast. Angus and Tony here from Adio Media, and we just got off having a chat with the great Martin Harvey, a round two, because we know that you loved the first chat we had from the feedback. We wanted to get him back on to dive in to more communication strategies so that you can connect with people uh, quicker, more effectively, more efficiently uh, to grow your practice and mm. have a more meaningful connection with people. So great chat. We talked about really how to break through the noise, um, whether that be the noise of social media or whether you're communicating with people one on one. How do we break through the noise and how do we invite them into our practices so that we can do our great work? So, you know, we chatted through all that way from attention to interest to desire to, you know, Martin has some really great frameworks to uh, really, in fact, the, the big thing we talked about is how do you build massive amounts of knowing, liking and trusting in your community? And, and using our natural, native, innate wiring that all people have to communicate effectively. It's not about, you know, tricking people or, but he has some great strategies on how to communicate with people so that they get what you're saying trust you, know you, like you, and then make a better buying decision. Yeah, so Martin takes through a process, the fastest way for you to actually build trust when you're communicating with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, to how you can build levels of empathy and break through the noise online. We mm. talked about the three levels of why to move from feature to benefit. And Martin shares one of my favorite stories about a patient of his who had headaches that every time I hear this story, it literally rocks me to my core. It's a great reminder for us as health practitioners about the importance of, of what we do here as well. Uh, you know, uh, Martin's a genius. He takes this concept of communication, brings with it the research of the social science about what works right now. And if you want to reach more people, if you wanted to be a community influencer, if you want to have more impact in your community, you're going to love this. Shall we dive in? Let's go. See you in there. Martin Harvey, welcome back to the Marketing Your Practice podcast. Good to see you again. It's awesome to be back. I feel very privileged to get round two. I sort of, I'm assuming I'm interpreting it that meant that round one was awesome. So uh, I hope that was right. Well, this is, this is the first time we've had a second date yeah. with any of our guests. So um, <laughs> more generosity last time uh, was mm. well served. Paved the way for more. We want more of Martin. We want more of your style and your information. So here we are for round two and we thought we'd take it kind of to the next level. Some things have been bubbling away for us. Some things are bubbling away for you and there's more information that can help serve practitioners so that they can go ahead and serve more people and become uh, the leader in their community. So well, what's, what's bubbling away in your thoughts at the moment, mate? Well, one of the things that I sort of hear a fair bit of frustration that people have is kind of in that really early interaction with people, whether it's um, a real interaction, you know, they're in conversation with somebody because they're out in their community or the first time somebody comes into their practice or how do you connect with people in this sort of crowded space out there in the community, whether it's online or offline. Um, so how is it that, you know, some people seem to be able to... Uh, create a connection with people and, in, and then go through a series of interactions to get somebody to make the decision that, well, maybe this approach is for me. Whereas a lot of people sort of feel like I'm just talking into the abyss and I'm not getting any feedback. So I was, I've been, I guess, looking at some of the research around that area and what works and what doesn't and some of the things that we get told should work, don't work, and some of the things that intuitively we think, oh, I should do that. Uh, kind of bullshit. So I thought that that's one of the things that I've been drilling deep into lately is how do you start off on a thought that you're likely to create a good relationship with people and then transition from that relationship into hopefully a uh, patient um, practitioner relationship or however you want to define that. Fantastic. It's going to be a great conversation because, you know, we always talk, Angus and I are talking about it's the more people that know, like, and trust you that are going to have your practice, yeah. you know, booming. Yet they're also at the same time, there's greater competition for space, for attention, yeah. 
uh, out there as well. So we've got yep. to put certain things in place and do certain things to do that. You are the master at knowing how our noggins process uh, yep. language, yep. process information. So how can yeah. we cut through the noise? I think you, you too, because I, I want to give out, there's some unique things that you share, Martin. One of the things I just want to, because so many people get on and say, do it this way. And you go, well, why, why do it that way? And you go, well, that's the way I've done it. And what they might think works because of what they're saying is often because of charisma and other factors here too. I like that you even just started before and said, so I kind of went to the literature. I did some research. You know, there's a wealth. I, yeah. I look forward to you always sharing. Mm. You know, what, what are the social scientists showing helps? Because the same kind of thing that's going to help somebody give up cigarettes and alcohol is going to help them make other health yeah. challenges as well. We can learn from that too. So, you, you know, when you're listening to yeah, Martin Luther King, know there's a wealth of information behind it. So, go on. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Up. Yeah, no, no, that's good. Actually, I think in terms of decision making, you know, we've only got a limited amount of time, money and energy to put into everything. So you kind of want to be using the best strategies and just learning by experience is a really slow way of doing it because there's, there's these times that you, you get a good result even though you made a bad decision and there's times that you get a crap result even though you did things right in that short term making good decisions over the long term is going to increase your odds, but you can't kind of necessarily make the right decision. I think a useful idea for us that in regard to that is if you drove through a red light and you got away with it, it doesn't mean that continuing to drive through red lights is a good long-term decision. Conversely, just because once you drove through a green light and somebody drove the opposite way and cleaned you up, i.e. bad result from a good decision, doesn't mean you should discard that strategy. And so, Sometimes start putting a little bit of time in advance of well, what are we going to, how are we going to go out and uh, connect with people, what's our story, what's our, uh, how are we going to resonate with people, looking at well, what's the research say in that area, it saves you a heap of time, make sure that you're better to go with a driving through green light strategy than a driving through red light strategy. So nice, man. Um, if we, yeah, I've, I've been working on that one, I'm happy with that one. Um, so really a parallel from, thank you, a parallel to your one is in advertising there's been traditionally this sort of formula of uh, AIDA which is A-I-D-A -A, which is really the idea with advertising is to get somebody's attention, um, stimulate their interest, create desire and then give them an action to take and so it sort of speaks to your idea as well of uh, how many people know you, like you, and trust you. Um, in that, that first part of it is actually, there's no, we often jump to the idea of creating desire for people. Look, these are the, these are the features and benefits of what we, we can provide you. You know, we're, we're drug free, we're, we've used this technique, we use that technique, whatever these features are, and maybe we think we're a more sophisticated version of it if we then roll out the benefits of it. You know, we can help you with X problem or Y problem or, you know, we uh, hear some testimonials. And I actually think you need to back the, the card up a little bit further to look at, well, in this crowded environment, and if we're using, say, content marketing as an example, although it's a, because it's a principle that applies across the board, you've kind of got to get super, super specific. And this is where one of those uh, things that I think intuitively we, we tend to, to do wrong is that let's say if I use, you know, you're a chiropractor, like who can benefit from chiropractic? And you sort of go, well, look, everybody who has a spine and a nervous system can benefit from it. And you sort of go, well, that's actually not all that specific. And if we, if we look at a different example to... To, to sort of give the framework for how why specificity is so much more important in terms of getting people's attention. Um, like I, I'm keen surfer and so I'm looking to go on a surf trip to Bali in a couple of weeks and I don't want to just kind of roll down to whatever beach. I want somebody to take me different places so that I'm getting the best conditions and uh, in the right waves at my kind of level. Like I'm not looking for... Uh, death-defying triple overhead waves onto a shallow coral reef, but I'm also not looking for just beginner catching foam waves. I want kind of waves at my level that are challenging but not too crowded. And so when you get online to look for something like that, there's a lot of places that are just generically saying, 
we offer surf guiding or we offer surf group lessons or whatever. But the thing that will stand out massively is if they say stuff that's going to be important to me that solves my problem, which is I don't want the really dangerous stuff and I don't want the really easy stuff. And also kind of my value around that, which is I'm not looking for the, the cheapest one. I don't really want to be um, sitting in a shitty van with a whole lot of backpackers smelling uh, smelling uh, petrol fumes. I want kind of like a, a deluxe experience here and I'm happy to pay for it. So when you when I get online, that's kind of the filter for what I'm looking for. And the more specific somebody can be with the information that is, we, we recognise that, you know, you're somebody who's been surfing a long time, but you're maybe not as young, so you're not looking for the, the real heavy, heavy stuff. Look, whatever the languaging is, they've got to kind of craft it to me or people like me, me as an avatar for a group of people, which in that domain I imagine is desirable. Price, I'm not price sensitive, um, but, I'm, but you know, I'm looking for something fairly specific that they can deliver. So if we now look into a health domain, what, rather than saying I'm looking for people with a spine as a chiropractor or I'm looking for, if you're a naturopath, I'm looking for people who have a health problem or whatever it is, you've got to be way, way more specific uh, to get the, uh, the right audience. And I think that when I did a course with you guys um, on how to do that in an online marketing sense, you're essentially talking about creating a really specific avatar, like one person that you're talking to and, and get really empathising with what, what was important to them, what their challenges were, uh, what their values were, so that you can create a picture. So um, Seth Godin, I love the term that he has of where rather than talking about, you know, that here in technology, they talk about a minimal bi minimally viable product, like you've got to get stuff out there to get feedback from customers. He talks about what, how can you create a minimally viable audience? Like what's the smallest audience you can possibly have that would support your practice? And what is the people that are specifically your, you can help and getting really, really clear on what that is. So, um, so if you guys give me, what would be somebody, what, like what, Tony, when you're in practice, who would be your favourite people to see? Uh, they were 25 to 40 year old females with headaches. With headaches, okay. So we're starting off really pretty specifically and then we can, if we can put ourselves in their uh, shoes and, th and we can start to think, well, where are 25 to 45 year old women hanging out that is, I can meet them in a professional environment or a professional way. And so there's going to be online places like a 25 to 45 year old. There's probably, I'm assuming you guys know this way better than me. It's probably going to be Instagram rather than, uh, rather than uh, Snapchat. Um, and there's also going to be, if they're, or, but there's also going to be a yoga class rather than a curves class. There's a whole lot of different ways where you can start to drill down where are these people. But then in terms of well, how do you create attention for them, you've got to get super, super specific with them with the information that you're putting out there. So the easiest example would be um, looking at, well, if they're somebody with headaches, what's the information that they're not getting? What's their challenges? What's, how do I understand their problem better? Now, the reason I talk about a problem is I mentioned earlier there's this idea that uh, of features and benefits, and it was a classic sort of marketing idea that, um, nobody's interested in features. What they're interested in is the benefits that they derive from your service rather than the features of it. And the, I think there's the classic marketing quote around that is nobody really wants a four inch drill bit. They want a four inch, a four inch hole or whatever. Is that the metaphor? Am I saying That's that correctly? Yeah. Yes. No one's drill bit, no one wants a hole. Yeah. yeah. But I actually look at it, who actually wants a hole? Like, I'm not sure that anybody actually really wants a hole. What they want is what a, the problem that a hole starts to solve. So the benefit might be the hole, but the, the actual true problem that it solves is it allows you to stick your, your, your shelving up on the wall properly. And that, if we go another layer deeper into that problem, allows you to take this messy room and tidy it up. 
and mm. you could go even a, a level deeper emotionally around that and it um, helps me see myself more as the person that I want to be which is a tidy ordered person or uh, it makes my partner happier with me because I've created this space that uh, is something that they desire this sense of order that they're not getting in our So my point then is if we translate that idea of features, benefits, and even a step more important to people is what's the problem that it solves? And then a step deeper than that, what's the emotional resonance of solving that problem? And we come back to a 25 to 45-year-old uh, woman with headaches, what's the, um, what's the problem that is being solved by, so if we rewind it, the feature of that is I do chiropractic care, the benefit is it'll sort out your headache, but we're still talking about a four inch hole, not a more resonant kind of solution to that. And so then you, I think the empathy that you create with, with the 25 to 45 year old women that I've taken care of, what's the emotional resonance? What's the headache stopping them from doing? And so for a lot of 25 to 45 year old women, it's, I just don't feel like I can be with my friends the way that I would normally. It comes to the end of the week and I'm just wrecked having got through the week and I've got no time or energy to be with my friends. So I just feel like I'm on this constant cycle. I'm never really living the way that I want to. Or I'm getting more and more fat because I can't exercise because the headaches are just making me feel flat or unable to exercise. Or there's a level up there and the more specific that the, your outreach is to the problem and the emotional resonance of their problem, the more attention that we're going uh, we're gonna get. So uh, if you just quickly sort of think of a message that you could have, you're thinking Instagram maybe because it's, it's fishing in the right pond rather than Snapchat. And then it's a message about, look, are you frustrated with, uh, not getting to enjoy your time with your friends and families because you've got headaches that just won't go away. And it's much more specific in terms of, well, yeah, that's how I feel this person gets me. Um, and so we get both the attention piece of the puzzle and we also start to get your part about the likability part. If people know or like you, that's the, the, the formula to then get them a little bit further down the line. It, um, it, it brings massive amounts of trust when I feel like you know and understand me in any relationship, you know, when we talk about uh, mirroring postures, you know, matching somebody's tone, that kind of stuff there too. When we can do that kind of thing online by describing their life better than they can describe it, yeah. then, you know, yeah. you start to get under that path of, you know, we've got incredibly noisy feet. That's for me. Martin understands me in this case. Tony really understands me. Let me read more mm. as, as, as well. I, I think, you know, in trying to shift those uh, features into benefits, you know, usually kind of, I often get people to do three levels of why. Well, why do you need to draw, do a hole? Why do you need the hole? I got to put a shelf put up there. Why do I want to put yeah. a shelf up there? Three whys often gets you to yeah. a really good benefit. Sometimes it needs to go more yeah. than that as well. But I, I, yeah. It, it often, because you, you have a powerful story about a headache patient that I often think about all the time, because as practitioners, yeah. we become numb to it. People come into us with problems, we help them, the yeah. problems go away, and we think, oh, I just helped someone yeah. with headaches today. Can, can you just yeah. share the story of the, the guy that came into you with the headaches? Yeah. Yeah, it was quite a pivotal moment for me in terms of um, a, this idea of, and I think sometimes as practitioners, we get excited about the technical side of it. Like, oh, I have this person who came in with, um, you know, this loss of cervical curve and I've got it back. Or, uh, you know, like this really wild uh, HRV reading and we got that back on track. It's stuff that's not necessarily meaningful for people in and of itself. And we often, the things that we can help people from a symptomatic perspective, we're often all, almost sort of poo-pooing them. And, well, that's not really what it's about, getting rid of your headaches. It's about the unlocking of your human potential. And I had this experience with this guy, Tony, who had come in to see me for years. And his family had come in to see me. And I'd actually forgotten the original reason that he'd come in. Like, he was just one of those people who came in to proactively look after himself and he was shifting to Sydney. He and the family were shifting and they came into me and, um, you know, I had organised for a chiropractor to take care of them. But you know how there's the people who you feel like are your true believers, the people who really kind of get the big picture of what you're about? 
I always found him a pleasant guy, but I, I never felt that real sense of he's in that inner circle of people who just love what I do. Um, and anyway, he came and I, it was the last visit that I was going to see him. And I said, oh, look, here's the details of the chiropractor in Sydney. It's been really lovely knowing you. But, you know, I was almost kind of moving out of the room, out of the adjusting area. And he, he said, look, now hang on a minute. I just, there's something that I've, I've wanted to say and I just have never had the opportunity to say it. And I think, oh, shit, what's this about? Um, and then he's like, you, you probably remember and I, that you know, five years ago when I first came in for care that my reason for coming in was that I had headaches. And I think I could not, didn't remember it at all. Mm -hmm. like, but what I didn't tell you at the time was that um, these headaches were just taking over my life, that it, I really couldn't cope. I was really at my wits end. I'd tried everything. You probably remember that I went and been to a neurologist who'd said that the type of headaches that I had were likely to get worse over time, not better, that there was really nothing they could do other than give me medication. And the medications were just making, taking me out of myself. I was a zombie when I was on them, but I was just useless when I wasn't. So I felt completely trapped. And I really, even though I love my family and love my my kids I just could not imagine that I could go on like this and so I sort of decided that if chiropractic didn't sort it out I was going to kill myself and it was a really powerful lesson to me that I was completely oblivious to how big the change was and how I diminished the symptomatic part of his care. Like I, it was just to me pretty much just as well, most people who have headaches notice that when they have chiropractic care, they improve or go away and that's no big deal. And not having been somebody who had headaches, I guess I didn't have that, that experiential empathy, but it did really put me on a path to, I think what Angus was talking about, that things that there's always two or three layers of why behind an apparent problem or an apparent uh, benefit, there's, there's layers of emotion and resonance and impact on people's lives that we need, need to get. And so if we sort of tie that back into that idea of no like and trust, getting people to, uh, getting an understanding of the, the real size of a problem for people is a really important way of going if somebody's coming, if we talk about the previous pieces about people getting to know and like you a little bit, they're still coming in to see you pretty sceptical. It's just the nature. People are very sceptical today because they, they're constantly over-promised and under-delivered. And um, a lot of non-medical healthcare comes with a little bit of a natural bias against it. There's a, we don't have cultural authority, so people take what we say as being, oh, well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but that empathetic viewpoint of really taking the time to do those layers of why or what I teach as unpacking questions of really reconnecting the emotion with the experience that people have is a massive way of creating empathy and empathy is the currency of trust. So yeah. that's, that's a really big distinction there. Still moves me that, that um, whole story there too. So yeah. It, it, so in, in our communications, whether we're reaching out, we're deciding that this person is on, uh, um, you know, in this case, Instagram, we've, we've put out some content yeah. addressed towards that too. What, what are the next steps that we go through? Because I'm guessing yeah. this comes under that A area there where we're trying to get their attention. We've done that yeah. by speaking to more than just their symptoms as well. Where, where do we go yeah. from there? Okay, so I guess the, the big thing to, that I think is important for people to, to connect with, yes, you can get people's attention, but also to recognise that the science of people taking action in this, in this very noisy environment is them hearing a message or seeing you doesn't mean they know you. That there's knowing is a process, and the literature is that in general people need... Um, on average, nine to 11 touch points before they're likely to make a decision to, to come in to see you. And that's doubled over recent years as people are more, I guess, sort of, uh, not over recent years, over the last sort of 10 years, I think, is the, the statistic. So people are going to need to see your message. And so if we're looking at outreach, something we have to commit to a particular message for a period of time. We can't be chopping and changing our message the whole time. We've got to say, no, it's really for me about this. There's got to, I know there's this 
uh, minimal viable audience out there, this super specific group of 25 to 45 year old women who value their social life, who are having headaches and it's impacting them. And I'm gonna just keep putting out slightly different variations on that message so that they really start to know me. They start, like each message is sort of not necessarily building on each other, but having a different, slightly different nuanced perspective. Because one, the, the, flip, the other element to that that we, is really important to know is if, we, if something is specific to our current problems and our priorities, then we're willing to really invest some time in, in not just reading the headline. We're going to be happy to get some information from there. So um, there's, if I go into the, the reason I'm focusing on problems here as well, um, is that we are much more motivated away from what we don't want than we are towards what we do want. So Daniel Kahneman, who's a Nobel Prize winning uh, behavioural economist, did some research that allows us to sort of quantify it. When he was looking at people um, taking a risk to win money in an experiment versus uh, taking a risk and, they, and possibly losing money, we were, we were about 400% more motivated away from pre preserving our money like pre towards that preservation, that avoiding the negative than we were towards a gaining a positive. So we're cognitively wired to um, avoid that risk. So if we're looking at how two different messages in terms of creating attention, what I'm going to suggest you do is not that, that uh, healthcare shouldn't have a positive dimension, but if you're wanting to grab attention, it's going to be much more fruitful talking about a problem that you can solve than uh, some rainbows and unicorns world that you can create, even though I think that positive health is, uh, perspective is a really important one. So um, if we loop back around there then, what, what, we're, what I've essentially said is if you're wanting to get to that next level, it's actually about repetition of the same sort of process. And then it's about having, and so you guys are the experts in automating that so that you're not having to have like the same conversation. You just have to invest in that upfront. This is, I'm investing some time in empathizing based on the people that I've currently seen who are uh, representative of the, these are the people I'd love to have my whole practice full of or most of my practice full of. How do I empathize with the problem that they've had? Go three whys into the problem so that you get the, the real emotional resonance because people make decisions based on emotion and then they need logic to back it up. We think it's the other way around that we make decisions rationally. No, we don't. We, we decide emotionally and then we, well, then we need the data to support it. So mm. if we're looking at, we're using our current experience of people who are representative of that group, we're getting an empathetic p perspective of it and then we're writing, well, how would somebody out there what would the information they'd need to know to maybe help them a little bit in their circumstance, give them a, a model of why they're, why what's happening to them is happening, and then, but also be patient that I'm going to have to repeat that idea to them a bunch of times um, before they're going to probably push the uh, ring, ring to make an appointment here. Mm. I like it too. I, I, Kelly McGonigal uh, I, in her book, Willpower, also talks about that idea of when we're trying to sell prevention, she says, when, yep. when you sit down with people and you get them to imagine their future, we all imagine it way better than what it is. Yeah. So I, I don't need to yeah. buy future advice off you because in the future I'm exercising, I'm eating great, I'm managing the stress, I'm sleeping awesome. all the time. Yeah, I got it nailed. So the yeah. moment you take me into trying to sell me that or educate me on that, like, I don't need to help with that. I'm, I'm ace tomorrow, you know. So it, it would just, yeah, yeah. yeah it, was, it was interesting. And it was also... You know, as proactive as I feel like I'm in my life, I think I was chatting with you a couple of years ago, I came to the realisation that I'm way more driven away from, you know, pain than I am towards that. So I just use it as a motivator now. Uh, yeah. It's a yeah. sad realisation for me, but it's how I am, mm. along with most yeah. of the people there too. So, you know, yeah. and yeah. In, inside of that too, there can often be this story of, oh, you know what, I'm all about whole health and I don't want to be just treating these symptoms you can, there's a way that you can, you know, create your videos because if you're talking about headaches, you can start a conversation with the headache and it's not bait and switch to then lead somebody to say, hey, listen, it's more than about the headache. You know, the headache is a, a reflection of yeah. a health problem, not a head problem. Let me tell you why. Yeah. And then all of a sudden yeah. you've opened yeah. them up into a bigger world. It's not a bait and switch. You haven't had no. time. Yeah. So it, I, I know no. that's often a, a hurdle. And 
for people? Yeah. So one of the things that I think from a, uh, a communications perspective that is a really useful skill to have in crafting that message, whether it's out in the community or um, inside your practice, so that you're not, if, if people are motivated there and we know that's sort of their hot button, that's the, the problem that needs to be solved. And the metaphor that I often use in that regard, because almost everybody's the same, is if you're driving down the Great Ocean Road, enjoying the beauty of that vista out of the ocean and the beautiful little pockets of rainforest and all that sort of thing, if you see red and blue flashing lights over to the opposite side, I don't give a shit how positive you are. You're looking at the red and blue flashing lights because there's something broken. And so it's actually a good survival value to be more motivated towards solving problems than it is creating positives because of just, you know, the way that life is. You, need, you don't want to ignore a potentially catastrophic problem. So there's nothing wrong with being wired like that. It's just there's a limitation to it. Now, when we're talking about a communication strategy, then that we want to, yes, I, my big picture is that I want people to live healthier, happier, more active lives and chiropractic is a way of helping them do that. Um, and one of the key things they need to do if they want that is to almost sort of understand the limitations of how they feel. If they only do things when they feel bad, they're never going to get to a really high level. So bridging is a way where you start at the level that somebody is at, but you don't go to the extreme straight away so that you lose relevance for those pe people. So um, if we were to say your avatar of the 20, 25 to 45 year old woman with headaches with social uh, life as a high value, then my vision for her might be, I think that you could live a much more healthy, happy, active life where you get to live your purpose of connecting with people at a much higher level if you had uh, proactive chiropractic care. That's my vision for her. Um, but I've got to bridge to that because she's not going to click on anything that starts with that. But even if she comes in with a headache and I go, well, chiropractic's not about your headache. Chiropractic is about you unfolding your genetic potential and being the person that you're put on the planet to be. Yeah. It's, yeah, well, I'm happy to look over at the oh, sunset over there once the flashing blue and red lights are gone, buddy. But you, you kind of, you've told them that you're irrelevant to, to her, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so the bridging is really a simple way of saying um, and this would work online or offline. So there's lots of people who come to see us with headaches and, uh, and they're often frustrated about the impact that those headaches are having on the life that they want to live, the social life that they have, the work responsibilities that they have, all the things they want to do are harder or sometimes even impossible when headaches are taking over. And so we've been helping people for 25 years with those types of headaches. It's an area that I've done a lot of postgraduate education in, and it's an area that I have a special clinical interest in. So I'm really confident that we'll be able to get you headed in the right direction. And once we do, assuming we do, a lot of our people in our practice choose to continue on there to work on what the underlying issues that might have created the headaches are. And so we can maybe put in place a strategy to reduce the chance of them coming back. And so rather than just solving the problem, also kind of move into some more of a preventative capacity. What a lot of people experience is that as their body works better, um, that other things that they might not have necessarily connected with this problem start to improve. And so people notice a whole bunch of things. They might be sleeping better, concentrating better, noticing that their moods are better. Everybody's a little bit individual there. But I guess we kind of work across a continuum of helping people with problems like yours, then moving, giving them the option to move into more of a preventative phase. Then a big part of our practice is people who are sort of more in my, what you might think of as a performance or a wellness phase. So you can in kind of a 30 second thing, and obviously if you're doing that in a video, you probably will tighten it up a little bit, but that's me kind of ad-libbing it. And you can see that it just flows really easily. It's conversational, which goes towards our likability and trustability. And um, it's an easy way of not bait and switching, but meeting people where they're likely to actually see relevance and engage with your information, i.e. something that's solving the depth of their problem and then moving them through a, a picture that they may not have had of the possibilities moving forward. Yeah, beautiful. I, I love how you uh, reiterated their values, their problem through that. Then you used social proofing to support your story, your yeah. argument. 
Uh, and it just brings up a, a beautiful saying of, that, that I learned many years ago, which is people do what people do because people do what people do. Yeah. That social proof and putting that in, can you speak yeah. to that a little bit? Yeah, so what, this goes to your idea, to the idea, it sort of ties in with your uh, um, no like and trust idea. In uncertain circumstances, we don't know who to trust. And so we are wired to be these kind of social apes that um, we, we, our genetics are those of a hunter gatherer. And so a lot of our behaviours are driven around what behaviours would make sense if you hung out with uh, what's Dunbar, Dunbar's number, 175 or something, a tribe of roughly 150, 175 people. And so if you're in an uncertain circumstance, one of the shortcuts that you can take to come to a pretty good decision is what are the other people here doing? And they probably worked it out, so I'll do that. And so it's such a central idea that Cialdini, who's sort of the godfather of the influence literature, it's one of his first seven principles is social proof. In uncertain circumstances, we look to the behaviour of others to inform what the right decision is. And so we can borrow social proof by using language like um, we've got a lot of experience, we've got a lot of people, there are many people like this in our practice, and it just shows oh, other people are doing this. It's also useful in practice to tell stories of other people. Look, I've had another client in very similar circumstance and tell their story because, again, it's one of those things that builds social proof. Yeah. Mm, powerful. And we, we've all experienced that social proof and sometimes even it has an illogical drive in that if we're looking for a restaurant in a city that's oh, yeah. strange for us, you know, in many ways you go past a place that there's a huge queue out the front that means, okay, I'm going to have to wait before I get in there. We will choose that over the place that's next door and empty, even though that might not be able to get there and eat straight away. So it's a great, you know, the way that you kind of put it from there too is, you know, is, is important there too. So it's, yeah, I, I, on that note, I find it fascinating, yeah. Martin, that, that often uh, practitioners and, and anyone in business really don't apply what happens to us. So it's me not applying to my, the decisions or the reasons why I do shit. Oh, no, no, no. I don't need to apply that to my patients or my community. And it's just going, what makes me make a buying decision? How can I then put that onto my community yeah. to assist them yeah. in having a better life? Everyone wins. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it's actually I, one of the things. No, go. I'm oh, going, sorry. No, no, no. I was just going to say. One of the things that we. <laughs> one of the things that we. We must have, we, we must be like 800 metres away from each other in the real world, but we've got this, I think our internet connection is going via Guatemala or something because it's lagging a little. Um, so the, um, the thing that I feel like we bounced off a couple of times that I wanted to come back to because it's a super important piece is that idea of trust because we live in a... It's, so when it comes to health decisions... Trust is massive. There's an intimacy to having a health issue that means that trust is a premium. There's a fear associated with a lot of people having health issues. Oh, is this a, you know, a sign of something? If we look at people with headaches, a lot of people will look at a headache and go, oh, you have a brain tumor, you have a headache. And so there's a whole lot of fear. And then there's uh, this, if you're in a non-medical health profession, there's also the fear of, oh, is this really the right person to see? And there's even other layers of fear where um, there's a lot of uh, current sort of communications-oriented information that talks a lot about identity and status as being the things that will most emotionally resonate with us. So what's the emotional risk of going to see a chiropractor, a naturopath or a, an acupuncturist? Well, there's the, the social risk of, well, what are my friends going to think of me going to see this person and how will I feel about myself and how will my, those close to me feel about me if I do this and it doesn't work? So there, if, if you, there's a huge amount of trust involved in somebody making a decision to say, all right, yes, I'm going to follow the path that you're suggesting for me. Where Again, Tony, the thing that you were talking about where you're sort of like, we, we don't think, we just sort of think, well, I've showing you what you should do. Why don't you just do it? Like I've told you without understanding that trust piece. So trust, you can build trust in an online environment by being that super specific. Um, so being, telling a story about the, the problem that they have that they connect with that oh, I didn't, I hadn't really thought about it like that, but that resonates with me as one way. The most powerful ways of creating trust though are in person. So I'm going to kind of shift focus onto 
well, what do we do when we first meet people that can really fast track us through that connection? So it's even more critical now than it ever has been because the trends that have happened over the last 15, 20 years to more and more of our life being uh, screen-based and things are automated and you're not really connecting with people. You've got you know, 5,000 um, friends on Facebook but nobody to call when something goes wrong in your life. There's, people are yearning for a sense of connection. People are very, very disconnected. And so the, the antidote to, uh, or the, the, what, the fastest way of creating trust is actually to create connection with people. Now, if we uh, go back to that idea of us being these social apes, the, if you were in a hunter-gatherer tribe, there are certain things that accuse that, yeah, look, I, this person, I feel trust, I feel connection with them. Um, number one, one is eye contact. So I think um, often as practitioners, we kind of know that there's, certain things we have to do when somebody comes in to see us, where there's paperwork we have to fill in. We make them fill in a form, we fill in, and then we're asking them questions and writing. The most critical thing initially is to stop and connect with them as a human being. So you want to make sure that the moment that you first interact with this person, whether it's in a consultation room or you're going out into a reception area to greet them, you make sure that there's eye contact and you make sure that there's touch. So touch in safe areas, so you don't want to be, you know, getting overly intimate, but you want to shake somebody's hand, you want to touch them on the arm, you want something that says, I, I see you as a person, I've, I've connected with you, and take a little pause, take an extra sort of second with it to make sure that you, you mm. are connecting with them. I like um, it. And no. connecting? Yeah, I was thinking too, Russ Rosen has a saying with regards to touch, keep away from genitals and eyeballs. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I think about it, just remind me of that too. But yes, touch, pause for a moment. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the, the next thing that I'm going to suggest is we look, because of that tribal sort of nature, um, we tend to... Um, naturally feel an affinity or a likability for people that we see as the same as us. So the, the advantage, and that is why in with that tribal thing of, you know, we need to know who, who we are and who the others are to be safe in the world. And with that sense of, um, of connection and trust with somebody, we want to be in the same team as them, the same tribe as them. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can do that. But if you're meeting somebody for the first time, and the example that we're using in your office, <clears throat> you're looking for a point of commonality. So if they were referred by somebody, you spend a bit of time in understanding who their connection is. I'll say, Tony, I see that you know, Meg referred you in to see me. So how do you guys know each other? Because work together, wow, you accountants, you know, you just, dive into their world a little bit, but we've got Meg in common. She's fabulous. I love her. You know, that's great. Or um, if there's other ways that we can create connection, um, whether it's we go for the same football team or we've got kids at the same school or whatever it is, we have this interesting way of being naturally having an affinity with people where we see a commonality with it. And Chaldini, when he talks about this, there's some really interesting things where if you have some, if you meet somebody with the same name as you, no other connection to them at all. It, we have a marked uh, increase in how positively we see that person. We think that they're a much nicer guy just because they're called Mark. Um, it goes even further than that. If they just have the same first initial as us, so if they're Mark and I'm Martin, I think Mark's not much better guy than Craig. So it's just this, this weird thing, this wiring that we can then... So, and the point of it isn't that you change your name for everybody. I was going to say, do I have to change my name for every patient? Or yeah, but that would be one strategy. Maybe but it's only... <laughs> In this situation. <laughs> just trying to build rapport with just, your mum. Yeah, we're trying to connect That's here, Dave. Just, yes. You are. Yes, you're doing wonderfully. Um, so, in with terms Mangus, of that connection. Moni and Martin. <laughs> Very alliterative, very good. Um, so the point is that look for some point of commonality and you can normally get to it with their, uh, who referred them, if they weren't referred, what their occupation is, some connection where they live. Oh, you live in that street, I live in this street. We've got, you know, do you ever go to this cafe? Uh, well, we're part of that cafe group or whatever it is, you find a way of being in the same tribe as them. 
Um, and the way that I, you know how you're saying we often have experiences that speak to these principles but don't necessarily apply to them. I don't know whether you've ever had this experience, but let's say you're overseas somewhere and you run into somebody else who's Australian and back here you would have no common ground with them at all. They like different, they like a different football team or a different football code. They drink different beer. They do everything, completely different sort of way of life. But just that common tribal thing of we're Australians in uh, the US together in the same place, you have this sense of connection and with that person and you see them in a much more like me way than you would in any other circumstance. So really powerful. It's one of those things that's a leftover vestigial thing from our caveman days, but it's there. So help people feel at ease by, by using that. Um, so another thing that is uh, likability makes people much more likely to, to do things with you. And another thing that, as well as that sort of connection with uh, people, is um, sort of self-deprecation. So I think sometimes people feel on a first visit that they've got to sell themselves to somebody where, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, we we've got a lot of experience with helping people with these sort of problems. You want to give people that sort of a balance of, yeah, look, I think I can help you, but you don't want to overcook it and oversell it. And, you know, I'm the best there ever was with headaches, baby. You just, it's not that sort of speaking yourself up. There's two reasons. One, it's not a very likable characteristic. We tend to like people that are self deprecating rather than people who come across as arrogant. But there's also one of the fastest ways to create trust is with a strategy or with an approach called candor. So the way candor works is candor is um, because we we have this bias. Look, I'm used to everybody telling me that uh, the, that uh, their solution is perfect. There's no downside to it, and we know you know the cliche is there's no such thing as a free lunch. Mm -hmm. um, so we we kind of know that. So we go into something. There's something seems too good to be true, it probably is. Mm -hmm. So what the, what candor does is it plays with those um, natural tendencies that we have to be skeptical if something is being presented as too good and does the reverse. So candor is essentially to offer or admit a weakness before you say you're good at anything. So um, the way that it might work when you first meet somebody is you're my 25 year old person with a headache and I might, before I said the bit about I've got a lot of experience with headaches, blah, 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 I'm gonna put in a little moment of candor to make sure that the, the orientation is correct. So I might say, um, Tony can be a woman's name as well. Can you imagine being a 25 year old woman for me for a moment there, Tony? Um, most, most I might say to her, look, most Tony, yeah. <laughs> Um, so and Saturday night. night. Excellent. Um, so um, in a minute, I'm going to ask you some more questions. We're going to do some testing to see if I'm the right person to help you. Because to be really sort of transparent, not every person, I can't help every person with a headache. It's just, you know, they're more complex than that. And so all I've really done then is admitted a weakness. I can't help everybody with a headache. It doesn't have to be dramatic. It doesn't have to, to be, you know, some... Yes, you know, chiropractic occasionally does have horrific side effects. It doesn't have to be that dramatic. It just has to be there is a, you know, not that it actually does, but, you know, you don't have to search for something that's dramatic. It's just like a, look, I can't help everybody. And then you go, what that does, as soon as you say, I'm not perfect at everything, the other person's, the way they neurologically process it, that is, oh, this person admitted that, there's something that they're not good at or admitted that there was a potential downside or that not there was no they admitted there's no free lunch that if something sounds too good to be true it probably is so if they're being honest about that and uh they're being uh balanced about that then i can sort of trust the next thing that they say because they've been honest and transparent with me and so then you go into the I've had a lot of experience and I've done a lot of training in helping people with headaches like yours. And so we, we get great results with that. And so that has a whole lot more credibility if I do it after I've admitted a weakness than if I try leaping to that straight away. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at that, the sequencing is really, with candor, you can't do it in reverse. You can't go, 
I get great results with headaches, blah, 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 because their filtering is going, yeah, bullshit, everybody says that. Yeah, well, why, you know, why is, aren't you booked out then? Why did I, why was I able to get here on the first day? You know what I mean? They're looking for, they're on the defense, whereas if you use candor, then you're swimming with the tide. They already trust you. I wonder too, mm. and you kind of brought up before, that there might be a bit of a listening and a cultural conversation when somebody's coming to us as kind of allied health practitioners anyway, that oh, they reckon they can solve everything. And once they go to a chiropractor, I'm going to have to go forever. And, you know, chiropractors think that everything under the sun comes from their spine. That the exact example that you said yeah. before just starts to disarm that a little bit. We, we have a Definitely. similar statement that we say in our initial consultation. And my experience physiologically when we say it to somebody is like, ah, oh, there's, a, there's a literal <laughs> yeah. relaxing like got it it's a really powerful kind of statement that helps to absolutely rapport there too but yeah so and so beautifully kind of articulated um as as, yeah. as, as well mm. yeah nice man yeah. it's um <clears throat> final thoughts let's let's kind of wrap this conversation up and i know there's hours more that we could we could chat on but we do need to yeah. uh, wrap it up final thoughts and and um how to kind of you know, piece this together for people perfect yeah so I think that if we look at your, I think, brilliant uh, idea of the idea of uh, marketing is to get more people to know, like, and trust you. I think that's a really beautiful architecture or framework for us to wrap this around. And if we look at the first part of that, first of all, they've got to know you. But people aren't interested in, uh, people are overwhelmed with choice of who they can know. Um, before they can listen. And so we've got to get super, super specific if we want to be relevant to anybody. And it's uh, ironically, it doesn't, we don't want to be generically good for a whole lot of people. We want to look for the people who you can do a great job of helping, who you love seeing, um, and then spending some time empathizing with the three whys behind the problem that you want to help them with. So I'm going to recommend you start with a problem, but then go three whys deeper to what's the real emotional cost of the problem that those people have. And you use that to craft your message. Then you've got to be patient because if you're putting your message out there, we think on the inside that people will take uh, action, the first message that they read. And the science is that the average is going to be nine to 11. Now, the problem with an average of 9 to 11 is that that means some people are going to be 20 or 30 times they're going to have to see a message before they go, yeah, now's the time. So it's got to be, I'm committed to doing this, I'm putting out this message for a period of time to actually have it impact people enough times. And there's automated ways that you can do it. I know you guys with, you know, remarketing and retargeting and those sort of things, it's not as random as that. There's a ways of, and there's email email conversations that you can craft with people where there's a series of emails that can do that, but then they've got to be super specific to actually have that uh, impact. So the, the, the two first steps in not, to, from my architecture and know, uh, like and trust is you've got to um, have empathy first and create specificity from empathy, and then you've got to be committed to repetition. And then once people are starting to engage, then the first thing is to create, to move into that likability phase. And likability, a lot of that is about connection, seeing the person as a human, eye contact, touch, self-deprecation rather than arrogance. And then it's moving from likability into trust. And uh, trust, the fastest way of establishing trust early is um, through candor, that idea of admitting a weakness, that people aren't going to be put off that you can't, you're not claiming to solve everything in fact that's going to create more trust that that you're what you're saying is credible yeah what a great story. beautiful you, you know and just to give our audience a bit of understanding when martin's talking about that kind of nine to eleven touches sem rush looked at about seven billion dollars of facebook spend they said 43 days and there have been other yeah. major groups that have said that you know off, if you were to take a group of people who have raised their hand and said, for instance, you know what, I'm interested in finding a chiropractor, a naturopath, of those, uh, only 15% of those people will have actually reached out and made an appointment within the first nine months. So if you don't have a process that, that you know, that different, so if you don't have a process that goes for at least nine months, you're missing the vast majority yeah. of people 
that, that, that are actually saying, I, I, yeah, I I'm really want you. Mm. It's, it's not that, you know, we think, oh, yeah. I've, I've ran this ad campaign for a month, someone comes in, it doesn't work. It's like, well, no, it takes time to build trust. Yeah. You know, so you, yeah. the, the yeah. person who plays the longer game is going to be the winner with regards to this, and you articulate it. It's so Definitely. beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. But as always, I, I'm, I'm always fascinated on the the way that you kind of package and bring you know things that can be quite complicated, and and have my little brain kind of understand it from there as well. Uh, we clearly need a round three with regards to this too. If our audience, yes, yeah, he's got it, got it, third day. Um, I, I know too. But you know, Lauren, my wife and I, Lauren loves you. Have lots of online trainings you do their webinars we teach people through this stuff there too you travel around the world teach it where will people go to kind of learn more of this from you where's the best spot for them to, to head to yeah work? yeah so um inside our practices.com uh, is the best way to to get the info there's um i put out fairly regularly um videos to just help drip feed people some of this information so most common one is one called whiteboard wednesday where i'll break down one of these ideas into an actionable sort of uh piece of uh content or an actionable strategy for people to use in their practice um the best way to do it is go to inside out practices sign up for my newsletter i don't share my email list and i won't spam them um but if they want to just get some more of this then that's often a good starting point. And then, as you say, if they, if they want to take it further, we've got lots of different areas that we can help them with if they want to dive deeper into something that will kind of work them through a whole process in a different area. So all the different uh, workshops are listed on the website. Beautiful. Well, we'll have a link down below. Click the button, get on board, everything insideoutpractices.com. Martin Harvey, thank you so much. And for our listeners, go and jump on iTunes or where are we? Stitcher, we're on Spotify. Uh, subscribe, give us a rating, leave a comment, let us know what you'd like to hear in the future. We want your feedback. Just say round three with Martin and uh, we'll get him back <laughs> on for round three. Uh, also check out Community Influencer, adiomedia.com forward slash community. No, adiomedia.com forward slash CI. Jump on there as well. Martin. You're amazing. We love you. We'll see you next time. Uh, straight back at you guys. Always great to spend some time uh, talking out important stuff with you guys. Sweet. See you soon, man. Thank you. Okay. See you guys. Thanks. <laughs> we shot this video the other day. You'll see it coming out where we're sitting on a park bench. And I swear, I've got the microphone in the middle. It looks like we're sitting there holding hands. And then there's some times and times of course. I look towards you and Lauren was narrating the other day I'm looking she goes, I'm looking at this. I'm looking at this. I'm looking at this. I'm looking at this. I'm looking at this.